Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We're in the book of Proverbs, and we left off last time in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 16. So we'll pick it up right there, verse 17. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 17. Grab your Bible, open it up to the book of Proverbs chapter 14. And I will give you a minute to do that. While you're doing that, I will remind you, as always, about the Scripture Verse by Verse website. You say, well, Marat, why do you always talk about your website? Um, because I love the Word of God. And I have been studying it for 37 years and teaching it for over 30 years. And I'm not a saver, believe me. Um, but I save that. And so I've saved 30 years of archive study and teaching going verse by verse from Genesis through Revelation. And so you can study the entire Bible twice through, verse by verse, at the Bible, verse by verse.com. Just click on the book you want to study, click on the chapter, open your Bible, follow along, and listen as I teach it verse by verse. One more time, that is at the Bible, verse by verse.com. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 17. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 17. God says, He that is soon angry dealeth foolishly. <clears throat> you know, even in the unsaved world, people who... Uh, get upset and angry so quickly are scoffed at? It certainly, I would think, would be the case within the church. But even unsaved people know that's, they would laugh at it, many of them. Others would hate the person. It's just not very becoming. Because people with a short temper act foolishly. And that certainly is true. They say such stupid things. They do such stupid things. Sometimes they throw, you know, whatever is handy. Slam the door. Hang it up in someone's ear. Smashing whatever will smash. Craziness. You know, I've often thought if somebody from, no, if somebody from outer space landed and saw a human being like that, the alien would probably radio back home and say, there's life on Earth, but it's not intelligent. This is really strange behavior. And so it says, he that is soon angry dealeth foolishly, and a man of wicked devices is hated. So a quick-tempered man blows off steam by saying and doing hurtful things. And you probably don't want to be around someone like that. I don't know who would. But a quick-tempered man, as bad as that is, isn't as bad as someone who has wicked intentions. A person like that is even worse because his evil is premeditated. It's cold-blooded. It's calculated. And there's more culpability for someone be, who behaves that way. Verse 18. The simple inherit folly, but the prudent are crowned with knowledge. So those that reject sound biblical instruction inherit folly. They fall from one level of foolishness and ungodliness to another. On the other hand, as it says here, but the prudent are crowned with knowledge. Those who are wise enough to listen to the scriptures are rewarded with even more wisdom and godliness, and as a result, joy. And so you see the difference. And one thing seems to be absolutely clear. No one stays the same. We're either growing in wisdom and godliness 
or we are losing wisdom and godliness. But there's no neutral in the spiritual realm. It's sort of like what Jesus said, if you're not for me, then you are against me. Verse 19, the evil bow before the good and the wicked at the gates of the righteous. Eventually, good will triumph over evil. The evil bow before the good. The evil bow before the good and the wicked at the gates of the righteous. See, that's why it pays to hang in there with Jesus. That's why it pays to do what is right in the eyes of God. Even if there isn't an immediate reward seen. There is an immediate reward, which is fellowship with God. And the ability to, to lay your head on the pillow at night and say, you know, if I'm doing things the right way. Jesus, I put my trust in you. <clears throat> but the bigger issue here in verse 19 is that eventually good will triumph over evil. And the Bible, for example, says that every knee will bow before Jesus Christ. And every tongue will confess that he, is, that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So good will triumph over evil. Because in the end, sin will be wiped out. And all who refuse to repent and find mercy through Jesus Christ will be removed and sent to hell. In the end, good is the only thing that is going to remain. God, good, good people who have received Christ as Lord and Savior, who then has made them good. Verse 20. The poor is hated even by his own neighbor, but the rich hath many friends. This is a kind of a sad commentary on the human race. God knows that many people form friendships on the basis of self-interest. And uh, that's kind of sad in and of itself, isn't it? That you would form a friendship with somebody on the basis of self-interest because of what you can get out of it. I'm talking about monetary or position or something like that. That's That to me is not a friend at all, but Nevertheless, that's what happens a lot in the world. So God knows that that happens a lot. And, and there's nothing wrong with mutual satisfaction from friendship. That's, that's not a problem. And still, like anything else, it can go too far. It can cross the line and become the sin of selfishness. And so God's way would be for us to care more about what we can do for people than what we can get from them. That's how Jesus was. He cared more about what he could do for people than what he could get from them. And by the way, when we do that, we're going to be blessed in return as well. In other words, be a friend to one who needs a friend and you will never lack friends verse 21 he that despises his neighbor sinneth but he that hath mercy on the poor happy is he it is a sin to look down upon a poor person or to judge them because of their poverty people shouldn't forget that Jesus came into this world very poor. He began poor, and he lived his entire life as a blue-collar working man, owning only the robe on his shredded back when he died. And those who said that, those were the faith preachers who say that Jesus wore the equivalent of designer clothes and, and drove a Rolls Royce. Boy, if that's not the most self-serving deceitful, lying piece of trash that I've ever heard. I don't know what is. Jesus was a blue-collar worker. 
and he didn't know him anything when he died, except the robe on his back. And, uh, of course, there's no virtue in being poor. But obviously, there's no shame in it either. Verse 22. Do they not err that devise evil? A person who plans evil is a person who is going astray. It's one thing to fall into evil. It's one thing to fall into sin. We all do that. But to plan evil, to devise it, there you got somebody who's going to stray, going astray, and meaning they travel through life on the wrong road. And you know what happens when you travel on the wrong road? You end up in the wrong place. A bad person's life leads him into trouble. And if he doesn't change, that bad road, that wrong road will lead him into hell. And so it says, He that despises his neighbor sinneth, but he that has mercy on, mercy on the poor, happy is he. And then it says, Do they not err that devise evil? But mercy and truth shall be to them that devise good. If we plan good, and do good, then we will also find good. Happiness usually isn't an accident. If we put effort into making God and others happy, then we will be happy ourselves, even when our outward circumstances are not the best. 23. In all labor there is profit, but the talk of the lips tendeth only to punery. In all labor, there is profit. All labor. God approves of honest work of any kind, at any pay scale. He doesn't judge us because of the titles that we might have or how much money we have in the bank. Even if a person doesn't make a lot of money, that doesn't mean their work is not prof profitable. There's still profit in honest work. You learn discipline when you work. You get an opportunity to be a witness for Christ in how you work. When a person works, they're doing God's will because man was created to work. Verse 24. <clears throat> The crown of the wise is their riches. Whether it's spiritual or material wealth, a godly person will have something to show for how they conduct themselves. Again, the crown of the wise is their riches, but the foolishness of fools is folly. The Bible says we reap what we sow. The Bible teaches that things produce after their own kind. The law of biogenesis is what that is. In the physical realm, anyway. But the law of biogenesis operates within the foolish as well. When a fool acts foolishly, he inherits more folly. He inherits an even more absurd, insane life. That's what he puts into life. That's what he gets out of life, multiplied. You know, at some point, a person needs to put the brakes on and say, I'm not going to waste my life anymore. I need to start living for God and doing things correctly. 25. A truthful witness delivers souls. A godly person who tells the truth will tell people if their actions are contrary to Scripture. Again, a godly person who tells the truth will tell people if their actions are contrary to Scripture. That sort of honesty can save a person from hell and also can deliver them from a lot of trouble here on earth. 
loving people tell the truth, even if it's uncomfortable for them to do it. And so it says, a truthful witness delivereth souls. People who refuse to tell the truth simply because it makes somebody else uncomfortable. That's not loving. You shouldn't be so concerned about what people think of you. If you make them uncomfortable, you should be more concerned about telling them the truth so that they can either avoid going in the wrong direction in the future or get back on track if they're on the, in the wrong road right now. So a truthful witness delivers souls, but a deceitful witness speaks lies. Speaks lies. <clears throat> a false witness can ruin someone's life with their lies. And the more people that you talk to, the more opportunity there is to do either good or evil with the words that you speak. So this is especially true when preachers preach feel-good messages laced with modern thought rather than the Holy Word of God. People like to hear pleasant-sounding lies. They do. It's always been that way. Many people like to hear pleasant-sounding lies. And preachers who give them what they want are often very popular because of that. Because that's probably the majority of people. But those same people who are lied to and made to feel comfortable will one day curse those preachers for their lies. Especially when they begin to suffer the trouble that goes along with them. Because there will be trouble. <clears throat> Verse 26. In the fear of the Lord is strong confidence. God says, if you fear me, then you will, God says, if you fear me, then I will give you confidence. Fearing God leads to fellowship with God. And fellowshipping with God gives us the confidence that comes from walking with the Creator, the all-knowing God, the all-powerful God. And there's nothing that will increase your confidence more than that. I remember in grade school, I had a friend, actually a couple of friends, my best friends, I guess. They both had brothers who, this was in an eighth grade grade school, first through eighth grade. So there's a pretty big age difference, but from, from the very beginning, um, these two friends of mine both had brothers who were two years older than us. And they never had to fear bullies. There wasn't a bully around who was stupid enough to pick on those two friends of mine because he would know that he would have to answer to their older brothers. And likewise, when we walk with Almighty God, we don't have to worry about anything. And the closer we are to God, the less we will worry. And it's true. When we're close with God, we don't have to worry about anything. The closer we are to God, the less we will worry. Jesus is my big brother. You want to hurt me? You want to be unfair to me? Fine. My big brother is going to take care of you in his time and in his way. So I want to advise that. Verse 26. In the fear of the Lord is strong confidence to depart from the snares of death. Some people talk as if fearing the Lord is a bad thing. Did you ever hear that? You know, they try to redefine it, and it doesn't mean live in absolute terror of the fact that God hates you or something like that. That's not true. But 
sometimes when I listen to people explain the fear of the Lord, they kind of explain away the fear of the Lord. It's not a bad thing. I do not fear God as a Christian because I think that he hates me or even that he's angry with me because I'm not perfect. I fear him because I know he loves me. See, there's the difference. I don't fear him because I think he hates me. He doesn't. I fear him because I know that he loves me. And I remember, I remember having to discipline my son when he was little because I loved him. And I wanted him to grow up the right way and learn right from wrong and be a better person. And I know God the Father does the same thing with his children. Fearing God is a positive thing. Because the more a person fears God, the more likely they are to do what is right and to confess when they do what is wrong. And that's very positive. Because the more we do the right, the less likely we are to be trapped by sin. And as a result, suffer the consequences of those sins. Verse 28. In a multitude of people is the honor of the king, but the lack of people is the destruction of the prince. Meaning this, a king's honor comes from the support of his people as they prosper and consequently increase in number. Did you get that? A king's honor comes from the support of his people as they prosper and, con and consistently and consequently increase in number. He's doing a good job, so the people are, are blessed and they increase in number, and that reflects well on him. And likewise, when we, when we follow Jesus Christ, when we allow him to lead, we will be blessed and then our joy reflects well on him. People can say, well, you see that man over there? He follows Jesus. And just look, uh, look how good he is. And he always seems to have a certain level of joy. Even when we know things aren't always the best in his life. See, that reflects well on our Savior. Verse 29. He that is slow to wrath is of great understanding. Having patience, being slow to wrath, is good. It's smart to be patient. It's smart to resist the urge to get angry. Unless it's righteous indignation. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, if God is being dishonored in some way, then... then it's good to be angry. God is angry with sinners every day, the Bible says. But on, on the other hand, patience is good. Smart to be patient. Resist the urge to be angry and to fly off the handle like we saw earlier in this study. When we respond to a difficult situation with patience, most people see that as a good thing. People respect that sort of thing, which is why patience is also a wonderful way to honor our Savior, who we claim to represent. Verse 29, but he that is hasty of spirit exalteth folly. If you are provoked many times and show great patience for a long time, but then you snap and you strike back, fair or not, some people will accuse you of being foolish. You may not be remembered for all the times you showed restraint. You may be remembered for the one time you lost your composure. Why didn't Moses get into the promised land? I mean, he showed great restraint for 40 years. Put up with the rebellious Israelites. It was terrible. It was difficult. And then he blew his top and he misrepresented God one time. And for that, he couldn't get into the promised land. 30. A sound heart is the life of the flesh, 
But envy is the rottenness of bones. Envy will make you sick. Envy is bad for your soul and bad for your body. When people aren't content, it makes them sick. An envious person is a miserable person. The Bible says we are to be content in whatever state we are in. Now, have goals of better things if you want. Dream of better things if you want. But at the same time, trust that right now, things are the way they are because God has sovereignly allowed them to be that way and be content. Someone says, well, I want to be content, but how? Well, contentment comes from knowing Christ and living for him and fellowshipping with him. Contentment also comes from being willing to accept his will, even if it's not our first choice. If that's not there, if you're not willing to accept his will, even if it's not your first choice, if that's not there, then throw contentment out the window. Paul didn't want to be in a miserable Roman prison for two lousy years, but he was content nevertheless and served Jesus by witnessing to the Roman guards. The moment what we want becomes more important than what God has allowed, the struggle begins. Did you hear that? The moment what we want becomes more important to us than what God has allowed, the struggle begins. The inner turmoil begins. You're not content. 31. He that oppresseth the poor reproaches his maker, but he that honors him has mercy on the poor. It doesn't matter how frail or poor someone is, they're still the creation of God. The breath of God is still in them, and they should be treated with dignity. And God is personally insulted when the unfortunate are not treated what treated well. Verse 32. The wicked is driven away in his wickedness, but the righteous has hope in his death. That is a wonderful verse. The righteous has hope in his death. If that was the only promise God ever gave to a Christian, it would still be worthwhile living for Jesus, wouldn't it? I think so. When you die, if you're a Christian, when you die, you'll be okay. That's a huge deal. When you die, you're not going to have anything to worry about. In fact, the second you die, according to Luke chapter 16, God sends angels to bring you directly to him and your friends and your family who know Christ. You know, sometimes Christians worry about death. But the second it happens, their worry is going to be gone and they will know that everything is fine and they were worrying about nothing. 33. Wisdom resteth in the heart of him that has understanding. But that which is innermost in fools is made known. I love this verse. Wisdom rests in the heart of him that has understanding. In other words, a wise person does not try to immediately proclaim everything that they know. A godly person has a sound mind, a quiet confidence, and a humble attitude. They have wisdom in their heart, and they know how and when to use it. Verse 34. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Righteousness exalts a nation, which explains why, as I teach this, America is going down the drain. We are getting dangerously close to the point of no return because of our debt. And what does God say? He says, when his people are righteous, they will lend to other nations, not borrow. Mass shootings are commonplace. People talk about the Wild West, and the Wild West was never this crazy. And by the way, by the way, if I hear one more politician say that this is gr the greatest country in the world, I hope I'm there in person because I will ask that person, based on what? That's just a cliche. Because in every category, education, quality of life, standard of living, health care, happiness of the people, America ranks in the upper teens of modern nations. Righteousness exalts a nation. 
And we are not as, a, as righteous as we once were in this country. If the people are good, then the nation will be great. If the people are evil, the nation will be put to shame. That's what the Word of God says. Verse 35. The king's favor is toward a wise servant, but his wrath is against him that causes shame. And that's because any king with a half a brain knows that he knows, knows that he needs, I should say, help running his country. The help of good people. A wise leader doesn't know everything. And he knows, if he's wise, that he doesn't know everything. Consequently, he surrounds himself with good people who will give him sound advice. Maybe not always what he wants to hear, but sound advice. And the Bible says in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. And I got to stop. But you can keep studying the Word of God if you would like at the BibleVerseByVerse.com. That's the Scripture Verse by Verse website found at the BibleVerseByVerse.com. And I did mention it at the beginning of the broadcast. You can study the whole Bible twice through from Genesis through Revelation using my audio Bible commentaries at the BibleVerseByVerse.com. Check it out if you're hungry for the Word of God. And if God's Word blesses you and you want to be a part of this ministry, you want to stand shoulder to shoulder with me and help me to get out the Word of God, your prayers and financial support are two ways that you can do that. And you can give in a secure method at the BibleVerseByVerse.com. Just click on the Donate button at the top of the front page and give as the Lord may lead. That's at the BibleVerseByVerse.com. Thank you for spending this time with me. Appreciate it. We'll be in chapter 15 of Proverbs next time. Until then, Michael Moret for Scripture Verse by Verse. So long, everyone.